This is the Fertility Friday Podcast, episode number 32. Welcome to the 32nd episode of the Fertility Friday Podcast. I'm Lisa from FertilityFriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. Thank you for joining me today. I love hearing from you, so if you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to leave a comment in the show notes, which you'll find at FertilityFriday.com slash podcast. And if you've been enjoying the show, I'd love for you to leave an honest review on iTunes so that more people can find it. Of course, a five-star review would be awesome, but anything just helps more people to find the show and it helps to move up in rankings and all that good stuff. And so today, I'm very happy to welcome my guest, Mark Sklar, to the show. Mark is the clinical director and founder of the Reproductive Wellness Clinic in San Diego, California. Mark has experience treating patients struggling with infertility and recurrent pregnancy loss with classical acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Mark is a doctor of acupuncture, a board-certified herbalist and oriental medicine practitioner, and fellow of the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. And Mark approaches his patients from a holistic and medically integrative perspective. So in today's show, we'll be talking about how to identify infertility issues, when couples should actually start seeking medical attention, what questions you should be asking your doctors, and we'll also be talking about male factor infertility and the importance of having both partners tested. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you so much for having me, Lisa. I'm so glad that you're here today. So although I did give you a bit of an introduction, I'd love for you to talk a bit about what drew you into this work, this world of fertility and infertility. Um, that's a, always a, a fun question to, uh, to talk about and, and give my story. Um, but somewhat by chance, actually, it's never, it was never my intention to, um, you know, I didn't wake up one morning and said, okay, I'm going to specialize in infertility. I really want to work with women and women's health. I got into school and, and I started, uh, interning at a clinic uh, from the first semester that I was in school. And it just so happened that the person I was supposed to intern with fell sick, unfortunately, and I wasn't supposed to inter and I couldn't intern with him. And the, one of his colleagues had an opening and she specialized in women's health. And so at the time I was just an eager student, just wanting to learn and soak up information. And uh, she had space for me, so I jumped on it. And I really never looked back. I really loved working with her and just learning from her and from her patients. And she loved having me. And so really for the whole time of my graduate school, I stayed on with her and really slowly started to fall in love with working with women's health and, and fertility, really the whole gamut of women's health issues. And that's really how it happened. You know, it was more by accident, um, although it seems like the universe had a plan for me that I was unaware <laughs> of at the time. Um, and, you know, one thing that I always found interesting is because we would work um, while we were in school, we would always work in the school clinic um, seeing patients and all the other, you know, the, the type of patients that walk into the school clinic aren't, they're not the same type of patients that we typically see in our regular clinical practice daily. And so it was a lot of, typically a lot of pain related issues. And my shift and my patients were always women's health issues. I mean, I had a random pain patient here and there, but unlike everybody else's shift, which was primarily made up of pain, I really was dealing with more internal issues, more reproductive issues, and and it wasn't something that I went out seeking for. I didn't market myself in that fashion. It's just what happened. Um, so, you know, I think really from the onset, it's just something that happened to me that that uh, the universe uh, pushed me towards, and that I I really enjoy working with. And one of the main reasons I really enjoy working with it is because I, I, you know, it's something that you can really see change with. You can really see results. You know, there's not you can't say that about every condition, mm -hmm. um, but you know the fact if if someone walks into your practice and they're having issues getting pregnant or they're having a completely irregular cycle or amenorrhea, and time goes by and they're either pregnant or they have a regular cycle or you know whatever that it, you you've made a result, you've made an impact on their life and on their cycle, and so that's something tangible to be able to see. And so that was something that I always loved um, about working in this 
field specifically. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, because you have your, your, your doctor of acupuncture. So what made you choose acupuncture? You, I mean, obviously you could have gone into med school. So uh, why did you kind of go with a more natural holistic route from the start? Um, well, when I started undergrad, I was pre-med for a couple semesters and I just hated it. I wasn't happy. Um, and medicine was always something I liked. You know, I liked um, helping people in various ways. So I did, and, and I had no, at the time when I was pre-med, I, I mean, I didn't really understand all the different varieties of medicine that were out there. Certainly much more avail available to us now than there were back then. And so I went into pre-med, I didn't like it. And when I was in college, I, do, I did what uh, most college students did, and I had a little too much fun, um, and I got sick myself with a lot of digestive issues, and, and digestive issues were always my weakness from when I was a, a young child. So it was something that just caught up to me, and at the prodding and pushing of one of my cousins, she suggested that I see a, an acupuncturist, and I did. And it really dramatically changed my perspective on medicine and on the way I approach my health and on the world. And if I look back on it now, I'd probably say she wasn't the best acupuncturist I've ever seen, <laughs> um, yet she was really impactful and she made a huge difference in my health, right? So one, today looking back on it, it shows me the strength and the power of acupuncture. But at the time, it really made an impact on kind of my path. And still, even at that time, when I was still in undergraduate school, I didn't, I still didn't think I was going to go and become an acupuncturist. I mean, it actually never crossed my mind. I graduated from undergrad, and I moved back home with my parents, and I knew I needed to do something um, and go back to school because I graduated. I'll, I'll, bear you, uh, I'll spare you the long story of my you know, undergraduate journey, but I, um, I graduated with an undergraduate degree in comparative religion. And, you know, my parents were kind enough to let me, uh, didn't give me a hard time about the degree, but once I graduated, they said, what are you going to do with this now? And they were right. What was I going to do with that degree? Not much. So I knew I needed to go back to school and my acupuncturist at the time pushed me and said, you know, why don't you go to Chinese medicine school? Mm -hmm. um, and I just never had thought about it. So she pushed me in that direction and I really never looked back. I thought it was a great idea. Um, I investigated i checked it out started school and never turned back from there mm -hmm. so i always think it's so interesting how we all end up doing what we do and so thank you for sharing kind of how you and you know your journey to to this to this place because you're making of course such a big impact in so many women's lives and one of the questions i wanted to ask you was about acupuncture when it comes to fertility and infertility there's so much talk about acupuncture and uh, when one of my previous episodes, I spoke with a naturopath, Dr. Shauna Daru, and she works specifically mm -hmm. with uh, infertility issues as well. And one of the things she talked about was how impactful and how much acupuncture can improve the success rate of IVF, which is just wild. And so the statistics she gave, I think, was something like 65 percent. It increases your chances by like 65 percent. Uh, so you talked a little bit about kind of menstrual related issues. And so maybe just talk about acupuncture and kind of how and why it actually works for period related issues as well as fertility. Sure. You know, I think that, uh, well, one thing I'd say is the, the statistic that the your previous guest had um, mentioned that 65 percent. Um, I think that's a little inflated. There, there's definitely evidence and research to suggest that acupuncture can support fertility and in some ways acup um, IVF as well. There's a little bit, you know, when, when that research study came out, and I used to quote it all the time, when that research study came out, it was probably now, I think it was 2002, and the following research studies to try to replicate that haven't quite produced the same results as that original one. What we've learned from that original one is that acupuncture can be absolutely impactful and very supportive and helpful. But what we started to do, or I can't say we because I'm not included in that, but what the profession started to do was really start to analyze 
how in really more specifically how and for what population of individuals it can be beneficial for right mm -hmm. and has and as IVF cycles and um, technology has evolved especially in the last three to five years it's really changed the way we work with patients as well so when when IVF in back in two, early 2000s had a much um, lower uh, success rate than it does now, I think mm. acupuncture really had a much bigger impact on that process. And that's where those results came in. But now that you start to have a lot more frozen embryo transfers and the protocols have changed hopefully to support women a little bit better um, and get better quality embryos, then really our job and our benefit I find is not as impactful on the day of embryo transfer as it once was. And, you know, I just came back from a, a big um, integrated fertility conference, and that was really one of the themes that we had discussed, like how important is acupuncture for IVF and during embryo transfer. So it really just depends on what the situation is. I do think that the real benefit that we find with acupuncture in conjunction with fertility is in those poor responders, so women who haven't typically stimulated well, or in women who we know have a, a true hormonal imbalance, let's say PCOS, poor poor uh, ovarian reserve and, and things of that nature. That That's where I think we really have a big benefit. And primarily, I find that benefit to be prior to IVF itself. Mm -hmm. um, the, the research that's really coming out now shows that we're of really great benefit for those individuals if they start to use us pre-stimulation cycle. Okay. And up to embryo transfer. And if patients have been able to do that, I'm really less concerned with us being there on the day of embryo transfer when they put the embryos back in on, during the IVF process. I find that's less important and uh, unless patients do want, want us there. And I find that our biggest benefit at that moment in time is that one, we're really familiar with the process so we can give them some peace of mind as to what's going on that day. They're really familiar with us, hopefully, <laughs> and we can we can be a little bit of a calming force for them. And the acupuncture itself can help calm their nerves and reduce the stress associated with that day. Because mm -hmm. as stressful as that day is, it's really more of an emotional day because it's such a big day because you're putting an embryo back in the uterus. But um, you know, technically, in terms of the in terms of the fertility um, lab and the, the fertility clinic, that day is actually probably one of their easiest days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> assuming that assuming that assuming that everything went well prior to that, and that the embryo thawed properly, if they're doing a, a frozen embryo transfer, that's not as technically difficult as everything that they've already done. So. Now, if a patient hasn't been able to get acupuncture prior to and they fall into one of those categories, that's where I, I think, yes, it could be beneficial to do a, a pre and post treatment. Um, but really, the way research is supporting is really it's about the whole process right now mm -hmm. and uh, supporting that process. And we can increase success rates somewhere probably between 10 to 20 percent. And some research shows a little bit higher than that. But that's really what we're looking at, and which is still a great increase, especially mm -hmm. when, when you have those odds and those numbers. But I, I don't think it's as, as great as it once used to be, potentially. Mm -hmm. Well, it's yeah. interesting because from what you're saying, the advancements have made IVF more successful in general. And so yeah. that's kind of, there's only so, it's, it can only be so successful, I guess. So it changes how it's it changes the degree to which the acupuncture helps if you're starting off from a better success rate. Uh, yeah, really absolutely. And, and I think that some of the places where we really help is to minimize some of the side effects that might occur um, as a result of the medication so that patients don't hyperstimulate. They are more easily, they more easily tolerate the medication as they go through it. Um, so there's still a big place for us in that, but I just think it's transitioned and it's shifted a little bit as, as time has gone on and things have evolved. But there's still that population of, of couples where they are going to be difficult to treat no matter what, mm -hmm. right? And IVF can't can only do so much for them. I think that's really the population that we really support the best because there's so much more that we could offer for those individuals than what IVF can do. Oh, okay. 
Well, and yeah. so I have, you know, some women in my life and some friends of mine that are going through some fertility challenges, some who are quite open to, to acupuncture and some who are not really, you know, they don't really know about it. And so people think of acupuncture and they just think of, you know, it's just a bunch of needles. Like, what could that do? Right. I'm sure you've heard that before, <laughs> but maybe you could talk a little bit about just why acupuncture works and how it actually uh, has such a uh, positive impact on fertility. Sure. So um, the research is, is pretty clear in two main areas. Acupuncture really helps to increase blood circulation to the uterus and the ovaries. Okay, that's one, and I'll expand on that in just a minute. And then the second is that it helps to regulate hormones, which is somewhat of a broad term because horm there's many, many hormones in the body and regulate could mean up and down, right? But I think that that term is really important because the research is pretty clear that we're not, we're not gonna always increase hormones. We're not always gonna decrease hormones. It's we're trying to support the body's own ability to regulate its own hormones according to what it needs. So that's where we're most effective. If there's not enough blood circulating to the uterus, the endometrial lining can't be thick enough for implantation. There's not enough blood flowing to the ovaries to provide proper nutrients to the follicles or eggs as they're developing. So that portion of things is essential. You need to have good blood circulation. And then the, the hormone regulation comes as we start to regulate the nervous system. So one of the more amazing things, um, have you had acupuncture before? I haven't actually. You haven't, okay. So. I hear this all the time with patients, and I I finished um, seeing patients a couple of hours ago, and, and I had one of my last patients had said to me, it was her first time in quite some time getting acupuncture, and it's just a typical saying, right? She, I come in, I say, how was your treatment? She's like, that was the most peaceful experience I've had in a long time, right? Mm -hmm. It's about, so there's one one amazing thing is that it provides a very quiet, safe space for them to be with themselves. Um, to meditate or rest or fall asleep, whatever that might be. But it also regulates the nervous system. And, and by doing, by placing the needles in, the endorphins are released, much like if, if you would get a massage or you know, be around a lot of friends and have a really good time and lots of happiness and laughters, you know, you're releasing endorphins, right? So endorphins are released and that's a, that induces a happy experience. And that helps to regulate your other your other hormones that are uh, that are controlled or regulated by your nervous system. And so one of the main glands responsible for regulating your nervous system is your adrenal glands. And your adrenal glands have a direct communication to your hypothalamus and pituitary. Many of your hormones are produced in the hypothalamus and pituitary. Like we in, for, in the fertility world, we hear about LH and FSH all the time, right? Well, those two hormones are produced in those glands. And, and so by it being, by being able to regulate your adrenal glands, they are able to allow your hypothalamus and pituitary to function more optimally. And that's where that regulation process comes in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so also uh, there was a research study done by um, some colleagues and friends of mine who they saw that prolactin and cortisol were regulated with acupuncture. Mm. And so prolactin is produced in the pituitary, right? Cortisol in the adrenals. And so you have, you have that direct response. And they showed that when that happened, after a certain number of visits, that fertility rates were most successful. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those two hormones being regulated showed a direct correlation with an impact towards successful fertility treatments. So we can see that, that, that it not only addresses the nervous system, that it also addresses the hormone regulation. And that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about, that it's hard to pinpoint and it's hard for people to understand that, okay, so place, someone's going to place a needle into my skin and what's going to happen, right? <laughs> but until you, <laughs> until you experience it yourself, you don't quite, um, you can't quite understand it and, and you can't quite grasp it. But that's essentially what happens. We've got an increase of blood circulation, regulated nervous system, and regulated hormones. And that's really what allows the body to achieve um, homeostasis and hopefully as time goes on, fertility and pregnancy rates. Okay. Well, with the fertility awareness method, as you know, you're, when you're charting your menstrual cycles, you're really able to see 
because you know many women learn through books and so taking right. charge of your fertility uh katie singer's garden of fertility uh the justice manual but however you learn the books always show you what t- uh quote unquote perfect or quote unquote normal chart looks like right so you get so excited you read the book 28 days you know a little bit of mucus or you get your period dry days mucus ovulation then you get your period you know 12 to 14 days later that's what it's supposed to look like so Mm -hmm. when women are charting their cycles if there's anything wrong it's quite obvious quite quite quickly whether it is that you're not ovulating that's pretty obvious because you're waiting for this event to happen and it's not happening whether you have mucus when you're not you know instead of having a, a mucus cycle that's kind of regular you have mucus and then it goes away and then you have mucus and goes away kind of typical pcos symptoms mm-hmm. um and then obviously various menstrual related issues like pain and uh, heavy periods and all those types of things so one of the questions i wanted to ask you i mean i think it's a little easier for women who are actually charting their cycles to see maybe when they should seek out help but when should uh, a woman seek out additional help when should she seek out maybe to go to her fertility doctor or to to even look into acupuncture how does she know if she's having issues obviously other than the obvious i can't get pregnant right um it's a great question um and one that i think varies from person to person um you know if we were all able to have the time were aware or conscious enough to, uh, um, and planned well enough in advance, then I think really the optimal time is before you actually want to get pregnant, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And and I think for those who've never had any reproductive issues, any health issues, that might probably not be necessary, right? They might just say, well, maybe I go in for a checkup just before, um, just to see what they say and see if whether it's my OB or myself or anybody else thinks that there's a real reason to be concerned. But they're probably the least likely to want to be proactive and seek out preconception care, if you will. But ideally, in a perfect world, that's when you would go in, is, is preconception. And especially for those women who already know Although I find that more, you know, a lot of women aren't aren't aware enough to recognize that, or don't have the proper education to recognize that what's going on with their bodies is not appropriate, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where I think the the education piece, as women are younger, really needs to improve. But if if you're having irregular cycles. Um, if you're having a lot of discomfort, if things just seem off or you don't feel well, you know, I think that's where preconception care really comes in. If you know there's a family history of anything like that or family history or history of of other um, medical concerns, then I really think that preconception care is important. It, It takes the stress off of things. It allows you to take the time to make the necessary changes without being forced into things because of this, you know, time factor that, comes about. And so that would be the perfect, more ideal time. After that, it's it's really, I think that the biggest factors are how long you've been trying, how old are you, and do you have medical issues or reproductive issues that warrant some attention? Mm-hmm. You know, the easiest of which is like, oh, well, I've been trying for six to 12 months or longer and nothing's happening. So maybe it's time that I speak to somebody, right? Mm-hmm. Or I waited too long, according to what the world thinks is appropriate, to get pregnant. And so maybe I should speak to someone sooner rather than later because of my age, whatever that might be for, for that individual person. Or they, they know that they have, again, they've been made aware that they have reproductive issues. And so that would be another reason to, to seek out attention from somebody. Okay. And Um, I I did want to ask you what your thoughts were on the typical advice that women receive. Kind of my understanding is, you know, if you're under 35, try for a year, you know, whatever. (laughs) If you're over 35, (laughs) try for six months, you know. I feel like that's kind of helpful, but not helpful. Because as you said, preconception care is so important. So I feel like it's kind of a disservice to just tell someone to go off and keep trying with no further information. Uh, So what do you have to say about that? (laughs) 
I think it's also, I, I would throw into that, by the way, reoccurring pregnancy loss or miscarriage, the fact that, oh, you, you know, most obese say, well, you have to have three before we'll do anything about that, mm. right? And the guidelines have actually recently changed. It's two consecutive or three total. Hmm. Um, and at least that's an improvement from where it was. But, you know, it really depends on... Um, I think the fact, the biggest factors is is a is a individual or couple's personal situation and their family planning. So if someone walks in my office and they want to have five children or four children, you know, it's not appropriate to start seeking help at 39. You, you, yeah, right? that makes you know, it like, oh, way more <laughs> challenging. Your timeline, yeah, yeah, doesn't your match. <laughs> is more difficult. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't match. And if someone is has both both partners have agreed that hey we really just want to have one child, then again that changes things. Well, maybe you have a little bit more flexibility. So it's really this fluid. I think it's really a fluid thing. The biggest thing that comes to mind is when you're ready to start a family. I think you should actually not wait and reach out to somebody, and just start to make sure that everything looks okay, because the because by the time and you end up starting to um, realize that something's wrong or feel like you need help. And then many times you even get the appointment with your OB, which that in itself could take anywhere from four to 12 weeks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're already behind the eight ball. You know, you've tried for six months or a year, or whatever it is that they put the magic number on. And then all of a sudden you realize, hey, things aren't working out. And now you've got to go take action. And now it's taking longer and longer and longer. So I think the sooner, the better. Yeah, you know that um, you want to get married, that you want to have children. Then I don't think it hurts to to go and, and speak to someone and see what they say. What's the worst thing they say? You're doing fine and, you know, you don't need to come and see me. Great. Okay. Well, I don't think that's a waste of anyone's time. I just think that you were proactive about it and then, and then um, you were able to make decisions that suited your lifestyle and your needs, right? So I think we all try to put that burden and put that on somebody else as opposed to taking responsibility on it, our own. And I'm a big, I'm a big proponent for, for being proactive and taking charge and taking ownership of your own health. Um, and so when you take ownership of your own health, that means you're going to go out and seek help when you think you need it and not wait for what somebody else tells you you should do about those things. And and we all tend, I think we all tend to listen to the person with the white coat just a tad too much, right? They We, we tend to look at them as if they are um, the president or, <laughs> you know, God and what they say goes. And I, I've had this conversation with uh, with family members and, and with others that it's okay to question your physician. It's okay to ask why they're doing something. And so I think this falls into that same same sort of category. So I encourage patients, uh, the sooner the better. And if there's a really a, a driving force or guideline, say, hey, after you get married, at some point, the expectation, if you want to start a family, is that you're going to try to have kids. So maybe use that as the guiding force, right? You get married, and maybe in the first six months of marriage, you make it a point to go get a checkup, speak to someone who can help guide you, um, and just see if you even need any more additional attention. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the, the questions that I was thinking about, too, was when it comes to... Um, well, I guess it's kind of a statement leading into a question, but I feel like to some extent, women have kind of like this knowing. And so sometimes maybe you can't put your finger on it, but you know, you, you kind of get a sense that something isn't, isn't going right or something like that. And especially if you're charting your cycles, you can see if something isn't, isn't going right. So I guess the question is for a woman who does see that there's some sort of challenge with r related to her fertility. So she is noticing that, her cycles aren't looking healthy uh, as they should. She's noticing maybe that her ovulation, she doesn't ovulate regularly or maybe goes a few, you know, several months between ovulation, those types of things. When you work with patients who are struggling with those types of fertility issues, uh, what kind of timeline, I guess, typically, I know it differs from person to person, but in a general sense, um, what can a patient expect if they are seeking out uh, acupuncture, uh, treatments what kind of time frame and how does how does that look that's a it's a great question and i'd actually actually expand on what you said 
they call it women's intuition for a reason, right? <laughs> yeah. There's there's no say at least none that I've heard of that says men's intuition. Not so much. <laughs> men's intuition, <laughs> yeah. right? So w- women tend to be more in in touch with their bodies and what's going on. And so tr- you know, I really think it's that gut feeling. It's about trusting yourself, and you know, something doesn't feel right. So making taking action based on that. So I think that's really appropriate. In terms of a timeline, that's the other reason why seeking out help sooner rather than later, I think is important. All these treatments, whether it's natural or um, assisted reproductive technologies, they all take time, right? Mm -hmm. And if if women, part of that reasoning for the time is because women have a beautiful thing called the menstrual cycle, and that takes 28 to 30 days, right? So you've got four weeks to see change, and then things potentially adjust or you get different medication or different treatment and then you get another four weeks to see how things change so there's a positive and a negative right you you really it, it takes time to notice the shifts that women are making in their cycles because we have a cycle to track mm-hmm. um, so that's something to take note of but in terms of treatment western reproductive technologies are going to be faster and we're used to seeing taking a pill or unfortunately, if someone has to have surgery, doing surgery and seeing the result of that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, natural treatments don't work as quickly, typically don't work as quickly. And I think that's important for for couples to recognize because, you know, you, you can't walk into someone's office and expect them to make changes in a couple of weeks. And if they're asking you to make changes in your diet or start taking supplements or whatever it is they're asking you to do, those things don't happen overnight and the results of those things don't happen overnight. So typically what I look for when I look for change in patients is I, I work in three month increments. And so ideally I'm looking for, I, it really depends on the condition, but I expect the first three months to be the foundational work. We're going to lay the, gr- the groundwork and the foundational work for the change that for basically for the pregnancy. And so I think we need about three months for that. And then I typically expect patients to get pregnant somewhere between the three month mark and the nine or 12 month mark, depending on the condition. Mm-hmm. Right. And so that might seem like a long time and, and it can be, it can be a long time, but some patients come in with extreme cases. And so we, we need more time, unfortunately. Now we do have patients who, who get pregnant in those first three months, but that's just not typically the norm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's good to have kind of an an idea because as you said, we're all expecting things to happen now. And it's just, it's, it's so interesting how it works because you think you're cool about it. You think you're pretty open to what happens, but when, whatever, whenever it is that you decide that you're open now, now we're trying, now we're no longer preventing pregnancy. As much as you're open, you want, like you expect it to happen immediately, Mm -hmm. And I talk about this a lot on the podcast because most women have been taught since element or whenever sex ed started. So junior high and high school that we're fertile all the time and that you can get pregnant right away. So we all think that it's just going to happen. We've been programmed to think that. And so it's, it's, I'm sure you experience it on a daily basis, how frustrating it is because it's just not happening. And I spent all of my life trying to prevent this from happening. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So uh, I guess leading into a question, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is about male factor infertility, because all the pressure is on the woman to to produce the baby. And I think that I I remember, too, when um, when my husband and I were first trying for our, you know, we have a two and a half year old now. And I remember he like you know, started exercising and he was eating all this great food. And it occurred to me that (laughs) it kind of sounds silly now, but it occurred to me, I was like, wow, that's really, you know, thoughtful in the sense that he actually realized that his contribution matters. So (laughs) I think it's, I think we (laughs) should talk a little bit about the bed because it's always focused on women. And of course, that's an important piece. But um, obviously, all infertility issues are not not attributed to the to the female partner so maybe you could speak to that and why it's important for us to kind of be aware and to focus on both 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 halves of this whole 
Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, I think that point you made earlier about um, women expecting that once they turn on the switch to start trying, or couples for that matter, turning on the switch to start trying, and expect it to happen overnight is a really true, true issue. Um, you know, we are um, misinformed and you're trying to prevent conception and so you, you're taking the pill or whatever it might be and then so you expect that any given time you can get pregnant. So if I stop the pill the next month, I'm gonna get pregnant. You know, the reality is, is at our best, we only have like a 25 to 30% chance of getting pregnant every month, right? At our best. And that's when we're like, in our late teens and early 20s. And so from there, it just gets less and less and less. So that's not good. That switch doesn't happen. And so kind of talking about um, what we were talking about before, that timeline is once you lay that foundation and, you're, and a woman's menstrual cycle is, is as perfect as we can get it to be when, when, like the word I like to call regulated, you know, it's, it's happening regular, they're having the perfect cervical mucus, they're ovulating and so forth. From there, it, now it's just, attempts right every every cycle um and so even then you might only have a 15 percent chance or 18 percent chance or 10 percent chance of trying every month and so at that point you really just need opportunities more opportunities mm -hmm. right so i think it's important to keep that in mind as you mentioned so i did i did want to i did want to just jump back on that topic before mm -hmm. we went on to the the male factor you know ma male factors unfortunately completely overlooked and when you look at research male factor contributes anywhere from um, 30 to 40 and, and maybe in some cases up to 45 percent of the time it's male factor issue or joint issue um, so that's a big number yeah right? 45 I, mean, I you know I don't think that's something to to just ignore and men's egos tend to get in the way and everybody thinks they've got super sperm and so you know there's no reason it's not them and you know there's nothing to uh to to look for on their part but i do think it's a really important um topic to to discuss the the um how males get kind of addressed in this whole process and i think one thing that might get overlooked for for women is that I'm, I'm pretty direct with with men, but I do think that in a relationship as wives or partners are dealing with their husbands or partners, you know, I think it's important that we take into account that, yes, men have egos as positive or negative, and that um, and it's a blow to their to their manhood to go down that path to even think or contemplate that they have male factor issues. Mm -hmm. um, especially if there's never been any in their family. I think it's actually a positive thing to some degree if they know there's a family history of issues because at least, oh, it's genetic, right? Um, yeah. It's not just me. And and they're more, more prone to be proactive about things like that. But, but sometimes that's not even talked about because of the whole ego thing, right? So maybe there was, but it was never mentioned. So I think as women approach their um, their husbands, you know, I think that they need to kind of take that, they have to use that perspective and that understanding so that they're not just attacking or becoming accusatory. Mm. Um, not, not that I think that that is the case all the times, but I think their husbands can perceive it that way, right? Yeah. And when they come with the facts like, hey, roughly 40% of the time, there's a male factor issues, so it has nothing to do with you specifically, but the, this this is just the numbers. You know, I'd rather know sooner rather than later, let's get you checked out sort of thing, right? Because the sooner we know, there's the faster we can do something about it and the faster we can make changes and make decisions. So I think if it's approached from that perspective, that makes a big difference and it, the other the other factor in that is like like women have to go through all of these tests all this poking and prodding the reality is is for the most part all men need to do is ejaculate yep <laughs> not the end of the world right not the end of the world maybe if someone wants to help them a little bit <laughs> it's even a fun experience but in general like that's all they have to do right so I mean, come on, men have done that since the beginning of time. I think they can go ahead and uh, 
and do that again and just aim into a cup and, and get it over with. So I don't think it's the, 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 the hardest thing to ask them to do either. I think it's more of an emotional thing of what they're asking them to do that can get overlooked. And so, you know, if it's like, I'm doing all of these things, it takes two of us to tango and we're both trying to be parents. So let's make this happen. Let's get you checked out. I'm getting checked out and let's just, you know, let's just look at the facts. Um, so I think that's really, really important. And I really do encourage all couples to have the husbands checked as soon as possible. And, and the, one of the main reasons for that is there's so much that can be done for male factor fertility, infertility. And to wait too long to do that, especially when the, the wives or the partners are having doing all of this for that, and let's just say we get them in a perfect place and then they're still not able to get pregnant. And then we have the husband checked. Now you're six months, 12 months down the road. And then you find out, Yeah. you'd be kicking yourself, right? So if, if the woman is already taking the time to make change in their reproductive health, why not simultaneously have the husband checked? Because if there's something there, then both at the same time, you guys are both being proactive to make change. Yeah. Well, there's two things that, that I thought of when you were talking, and one of them is uh, it is important how you approach your partner because it is a real thing, obviously. Yeah. You don't want to attack your partner. But at the same time, I could totally see, because I'm a woman, you know, and I know I haven't gone through the infertility treatments, but, you know, it's so common now that I, you know, I have a lot of women in my life who have had that experience, and it's not a walk in the park all no, the not. internal exams and all that kind of stuff so i could see a little bit of insensitivity there which is like do you want to hear what i did today all you have to do is ejaculate into a cup so can we get this moving so i could see yeah. why that the ins insensitivity would be there especially especially um if you have that additional layer of hormones if you're if you're having to take hormones for your infertility treatments but i feel like it really touches on the myth and it's this, it's, you know, we're 2015 now and the myth is still there that it's all the woman. Mm -hmm. And so both well, couples take that for granted that it must be, it must be me because I'm the woman and I should just get, be able to get pregnant. And so even I would, I would just imagine that it's still the last thing people think. It is. It's not at the top of anyone's mind, especially because women are the ones who carry for 10 months and then give birth and they're the ones who breastfeed you know so that burden is always on the woman right um or pleasure however it gets perceived <laughs> <laughs> so um and so yeah it's very common for men to think no it's not me mm -hmm. right um and that's because yeah, as much as culturally we have evolved up until this point and and and, and try not to make it seem like um, it's a male female thing all the time you know this sort of issue when it comes when you start talking about having children still comes back to that I think and so men tend to get um, looked at second and usually wa waiting way too long to do that um, and so I, I, I really try to encourage that if anyone's been in my office and their husband hasn't been checked that's at the top of my list and I'm, I had a patient today and she's been seeing me probably now for two plus months let's just say and the first day she walked in with her husband i said you need to get checked because you haven't been checked yet it's like okay it's two months down the road still hasn't been checked yeah and today i asked her so has he gone in yet and she said nope not yet we're working on it. i'm trying to find the right i'm trying to find time for him because he's got a big busy schedule and i get it we're all busy but and 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 and, and i credit him a lot because he actually came into the appointment with her yeah that doesn't happen very often right so he's already a step ahead and he acknowledges he acknowledged that he needs to be tested but even with him acknowledging that he has to be tested and wanting to be tested he still hasn't done it right so there's still that barrier and, and people just need to make time when my wife and i were trying to have children now granted this is the world i live in and see all the time but i just said you know what i'm going to use this opportunity i'm going to go have a semen analysis done one because i can't have 
vaginal ultrasounds and I'm not going to take hormones. You know, there's only so much I can do as a man, right? So I wanted to kind of put myself in their shoes a bit. Um, plus, before we start having children, I just figured, let me just go check, get checked before we start so that I know up front. And if I need to make changes, I'm going to make changes. And so I went through the process. Yeah, it's not fun. You know, it's not, um, you know, it, it's a little inconvenient and awkward. But again, in the at the end of the day, you're just ejaculating. So, you know, I think all men could can step up to the plate and make and make that happen. And maybe you could touch on what some of the issues are. So I know one of the things that I hear often is, you know, men's sperm counts have been steadily declining for the last 50 years and all that kind of stuff. So but maybe you could talk a little bit about what when when there is male factor infertility, what types of things are going on? Sure. Yeah, so um, there's three main issues that we're looking at for male factor infertility. You're looking at sperm count, sperm motility, the way the sperm swim, how fast in a forward direction, and then sperm morphology, the way they look, the structure. Does it have one head, one body, one tail, um, and or what variations of that? Um, So the other thing that we don't recognize, and when I read a report for patients and go over it that I'm usually having to clarify is that the majority of sperm that men produce are abnormal. Really? That's, that's considered normal. Wow. Okay. So, so if sperm motility is considered normal at 50% or more, that means that the other 50% is abnormal, right? They don't swim appropriately. When sperm morphology is considered normal, and that number, this number has changed um, a bit, but anywhere from 4% to 14% normal, not abnormal. This is 4 to 14% normal looking sperm. That means the majority of the sperm we produce are abnormal, right? So that is considered normal today. So we have to recognize that's one, that's why we produce 60 million sperm Mm -hmm. (laughs) at every ejaculate, right? Because the majority of them are going to be abnormal and they're not going to make it to where you want them to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this comes, that's, this being the point of as, as, um, as animals, as we are, we are not very efficient at reproduction. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons why. So when it's considered normal for things to be abnormal, right? You have to take that into perspective. So we're really just trying to increase odds and re- increase percentages is what we're trying to do. That's Recent a pretty powerful has, statement. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, it's okay. It, it is. It's, and that's why I said it the way I said it, because I, th- I want I want men to hear it. Right. Mm-hmm. And then um, recent research has we've seen that um, sometimes the sperm morphology test is not as reliable as we would like. So. We're now starting to not trust that as much and really focus on the other numbers as long as morphologically there are some normal sperm percentages. It becomes a bigger issue if that morphology is at 0%. Then we really have an issue that really needs to be looked at. So, and, and one of the reasons I think that we're seeing all of this right now is really just because of all the environmental issues that we have going on today. We have way more electro- electromagnetic fields that we come in contact with with all of the technology. We have all of these chemicals that are in our food and in our environment that we didn't used to be in contact with. You know, our food quality is not as uh, good as it used to be. So you have all of these factors. So I think uh, the reality is I feel like it's really not the fault of the man that you're seeing these numbers, right? It's not really an issue with their ego. It's the fact that we're exposed to things that we've never been exposed to before. And that's having an impact on our male fertility because sperm are so volatile and they're so sensitive. And so that's where it's going to, that's where it's going to show up. And for me, sperm quality, all of those factors are an indicator for overall male health, right? Mm. I always say that all reproductive health issues are an indicator for general health as well. So if there's an issue with reproductive health issues in both men and female and women, then that's really an indicator that there's something greater going on in the body and it's showing itself in the reproductive system. Mm-hmm. Because the last thing we need to do to stay alive as a human race 
is reproduce. I mean, as a race, we need to stay, we need to reproduce, but as a person, that's not priority. Mm -hmm. Priority is eating and breathing and sleeping. And so our body reprioritizes all of its functions. And so the thing that gets kind of pushed to the side is going to be reproduction. So it means there's something else going on somewhere down the line or somewhere up the line that's causing your body to say, you know what, this priority needs to get pushed aside for the time being because we have other health issues that we're trying to correct. Mm -hmm. Well, you just blew my mind with that fact that the majority of sperm are abnormal or have some sort of issue. It made me think about the role of cervical fluid in kind of filtering out the sperm because obviously the, the woman's body yeah. is playing a much more active role than is portrayed in the literature, I'd have yeah. to say. But when it comes to those factors, so if, if, if uh, a couple is screened, both of them, and then it does turn out that there's uh, some degree of male factor infertility, maybe you could just take a, a couple minutes to talk about what can be done to improve that and how uh, you've been able to work with male clients to help to improve those things. Yeah, you know, I like to customize um, my recommendations for each patient. But in general, I think that probably the, the three most important things that men can do is really clean up their diet. Um, and most men, I'm make, again, making a generalization, but in general, men tend to eat poorer than women. Maybe not here in California, but in general. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um, exercise is essential, but that balance. So not too much and not too little, right? So there's exercise and then sleep is, I can't stress sleep. I, I, I have found in the last year to two years, I talk about sleep with patients so much more than I used to because we're all overworked and we're tired and we're stressed and, you know, we're burning the candle on both ends and, and sleep is where we, our body rests and rejuvenates. And if we don't give it that opportunity, then we're just burning the candle. So, you know, I, I really think those three things are really, really essential and foundational things that need to be cleaned up for everybody, um, especially in men because of how volatile sperm are. And then sperm, just like really, um, just like uh, probably many of us have heard is that they are impacted by temperature variation. So we don't really want specifically heat. So we don't want them to get too hot at all. So, you know, jacuzzis and saunas and things of that nature really need to be looked at as well. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I think of as interesting is that, correct me if I'm wrong, but the sperm cycle mm -hmm. takes about 90 days. So that kind of means that whatever yeah. you were doing three months ago is what's going to determine the quality of your sperm now to some extent. And so what we were talking about yeah. earlier with respect to kind of, you know, if you're starting at some sort of, if you're making some sort of changes or doing some sort of program, the importance of recognizing that these things do take time. So I think that's important yeah, to that's, consider. That's just, <laughs> yeah, and, and men, we, we produce sperm every 24 hours, but the um, genetic influence and make of the sperm, which is what you're addressing, really takes about 90 days. It's called uh, spermatogenesis. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, so at the end of the podcast, I usually just ask a, a couple questions just to kind of tie everything up. I love asking this question, but what would you say is the biggest myth about fertility or infertility that you would like to see corrected? The biggest myth, um, I think we touched on it, actually, that it's a, it's a woman's issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's amazing that in 2015 that we are still having to address that, but I do think that's probably the, the, the biggest myth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'd say that. Yeah, I think, and it's, this would be the first podcast that that has been the biggest myth. So out of 32 podcasts, <laughs> But it's such a, which is interesting because I feel like it's so ingrained that we don't even think about it. So I'm really glad that we talked about that today. So for anyone who's listening, who's contemplating acupuncture, but is still on the fence, what encouragement would you offer them uh, to, to give it a try? I think for the most part, m the majority of our patients feel good, tolerate it well, and respond well to the treatment. Um, it is definitely... You know, I, I can close my eyes and think back to that first day I got an acupuncture treatment, and it's definitely a strange experience to lay on a table and allow someone to put needles into your body, but it doesn't feel what we expect it to feel like in our head. The only thing we can associate with a needle insertion is when someone's trying to draw blood. 
And so it's nothing like that. So I'd say really it's been, there's some good evidence to show that it helps. Um, it's been around for centuries with wonderful results. And I would encourage anyone to to really look at it and, and try to find an expert that could help them. But they need to find someone who's truly an expert, not just somebody who says that they're an expert. So I tend to refer patients to one website called the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine, aborm.org, and all the certified fellows have all taken exams and met minimum competency for reproductive health. And um, if you search on that website, you should be able to find somebody hopefully locally in their area. Mm -hmm. Well, and last question, for a woman who's listening and she's currently on the pill, She's not ready to have a baby right now, but she does plan to start to try, trying for a family with the next, within the next two to three years. What advice, if any, would you give to her? Get off the pill. <laughs> it's, uh, I say it all the time. I, I really am not a fan of the pill. I think it, in general, causes more harm than good on women's hormonal states. And yes, it's great at preventing conception, but I think that that also, I think there's there's a burden that can be shared with the man in this situation. And I think that burden doesn't always have to fall on the woman when it comes to conception and contraception. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I really encourage all my patients, if even, I see a lot of patients who aren't trying to conceive, they're just trying to regulate their menstrual cycles. I really encourage them to get off the pill sooner rather than later so we can really see what we have to deal with and what to work with. And so I, I, my statement would be, get off it. All right. Well, how can our listeners get in touch with you, Mark, and find out more about what you do? And especially if any listeners are in the San Diego area and uh, <laughs> actually want to come see you in person. So if someone wants to come see me in person, our website is reproductivewellness.com. And that's the information for our San Diego clinics here in San Diego. If someone wants to work for, I do a lot of Skype and phone consultations and so, and work with patients from afar. Um, so if anyone wants to do that, then uh, my website for that is marksklar.com. You can you can do either from both websites, but in general, marksklar.com is my, my internet kind of presence and, and world for working with people from afar and reproductivewellness.com is for locally here in San Diego. Perfect. And I'll make sure to link both of those in the show notes. So Mark, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to come on the show. And I'm just so happy that we were able to talk about acupuncture and male factor infertility. And I think the, the listeners are really going to get a lot from this episode. Well, thanks so much, Lisa, for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You can stop by the blog and leave a comment in the show notes for today's episode, which you'll find at fertilityfriday.com slash 32. So the number 32. You can find me on Twitter at Fertile Friday. You can also find me on the Fertility Friday Facebook fan page, which you'll find at facebook.com slash fertility Fridays with an S. And you can also find me in the Fertility Friday Facebook group. So you'll find that by going to fertilityfriday.com slash community and you'll be redirected to the Facebook fan page. So just uh, shoot me a request and I'll approve you. The group is in the initial stages and I hope to create a community of like-minded women who can support each other while learning to chart with fertility awareness. So come on over. So thank you again. Um, and as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.